So we're going to discuss one of the past HAPT um, exam papers today. We're going to look at question three from the 2016 paper, which is on the History Faculty website, if you want to have a look at it while we are discussing it. I'm Sarah Mortimer, I'm an early modern history tutor at Christchurch, and with me are some freshers. We have... I'm Christian, I'm a first year history student. I'm Josh. And I'm Aluri. Great. So, the question that they were asked about the source is, what does this extract tell us about the relationship between slaves and masters? So, what do you think? Josh, you look like you're Josh, about okay. to um, <laughs> kick so, off. So, I think perhaps sort of the central point that this whole extract makes is that obviously, as you would expect, the master has considerable degrees of control and authority over the slaves' lives. But um, the, the source also indicates that they have to deliver some respect uh, to the slaves, they can't just treat them however they wish, that there are certain codes and guidelines they have to follow. Okay, so if we break that down a bit, where do we see the control over the slaves' lives? Particularly, I mean, uh, with regards to, I'm just trying to find the right paragraph, but um, regards yeah. to marriage, where yeah. so obviously slaves can't marry unless they have consent. Well, um, just stop there a moment. So this is Article 4, isn't it? Article do you want to just yeah. say a bit more about what Article 4 tells us about this relationship? Um, well, I mean, it, it tells us two things. The first is that the masters have that level of control, but then it also does tell us that um, the slaves can marry in the first place, which mm -hmm. um, could be thought of as unusual uh, if you're not too sure about how uh, the role of a slave uh, works uh, in that regard. The fact that they are, are permitted a certain extent of freedom in that regard, as long as the, the master um, is okay with it, I mm -hmm. guess. And, and also, oh, oh, well, in addition to that, the slaves have to be consenting to the marriage as well. So it's the the masters don't have the full control, and it's not as if they could maybe sell them as more of a commodity than they already are through marriage. Yeah. 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 So for a marriage to be valid, we need the consent of the master, the consent of the slave. What else do we need? A priest. A priest. Yeah. yeah. Does that tell us anything about this relationship? Well, there's clearly a huge amount of focus on indoctrinating the slaves within the Catholic religion. Obviously, mm -hmm. the central authority from obviously Catholic France, uh, indicating that even in the colonies, despite perhaps any native religions, they are required to almost completely submit to the Catholic regimen, especially in terms of marriage uh, and keeping holidays and Sundays. Mm. So where do we yeah. see that? Can you point anywhere in the text? Perhaps. Uh, 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 article 3, right. uh, w which we charge all our subjects, whatever their status, uh, which is quite interesting as well, because yeah. it indicates that both the slaves and the masters have to follow the Catholic faith. There's not one rule for one and for the other, uh, but they have to observe Sundays and holidays that are kept by our Catholic religion, implying they're part of the wider French Catholic society. Mm -hmm. yeah. I found the element of parity, actually, in, I mean, especially within the religious 1, 2, 3 and 4, um, but the idea of the religious parity between the masters and the slaves was also, um, yeah, definitely noteworthy, and, and it kind of shows that there's quite a, almost a oxymoronic quality to the fact that there is obviously this massively delineated contrast between the two, the master and the slave. But then at the same time, they are actually, in some instances, considered completely equal. Okay. Do you get the impression that um, Catholicism is controversial in this colony? Do you think people are resistant to it? It's, well, it says will be baptised, as mm -hmm. if there is some sort of resistance to that. Yeah. It's obviously a, a foreign concept, so, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. There's, there's also, following from that, it says the comment in Article 2, mm -hmm. that we prohibit all secret religious meetings, right. which we declare treason. And they wouldn't say that they prohibit religious meetings if they're not going on. Uh, and it also there, interestingly again, doesn't specify whether the offenders are masters or slaves. So it's not necessarily just sort of native religion. It could also be, you know, Huguenot, Protestant, masters or other forms of religious taking place apart from the slaves. Right, and if they have secret religious meetings, what crime are they committing? Uh, treason. Treason? What's treason? Rebelling against the French state. Mm. I mean, is it a religious issue, treason? It's not explicitly. Right. So, so, what does this tell us? Can we draw anything out of the fact that they're 
um, declaring secret religious meetings as treason. At least at this point, there's um, absolutely no separation between mm. the church and state uh, mm. in French society. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so there's a strong sense that religion is part of this dynamic and this relationship. What else is going on? Um, <laughs> well, what do you think the slaves do? I can say work. Yeah, what, what kind of work do they do? Um, do they get much sense of the work they do? Well, I'm just picking up, they forbid the slaves to sell sugar cane. Right. So, kind of economic control in addition to religious control. Yeah. Um, so that's Article 7, isn't it? Do yeah. you want to just talk through what, you, what Article 7 tells us? Um, the master, again, is kind of submissive to the state. Mm. Like in a the similar sort of relationship, um, so the master still can't grant that permission. Nice. Which is the power dynamics there. So interesting. Um, yeah. So then, the, not even the master can allow the slave to sell sugar cane, mm. but can slaves sell other things? Uh, yes, but only with the possession permission of the masters, proven mm. through the possession of ticket. I think sort of what alongside this and other points sort of indicates is that there is an incredibly clear social hierarchy here. There is the French central state at the top, there is the masters below them, and there's the slaves at the bottom. But the interesting thing is the gaps between the two, uh, in fact the slaves and the masters seem to be rather close together at times, whilst the gap between the state and the masters is quite wide. Mm -hmm. um, Do you get the impression that all masters and all slaves are sort of the same in this hierarchy? Do you get a sense that some slaves are maybe higher up than others? Well, certainly through manumission, that's yeah. mentioned later on. Um, there's a possibility that slaves can become no longer slaves as long as the master grants those rights through a number of different um, means in the last few paragraphs. So, um, yeah, when it comes to that, why do you think a slave might be manumitted? Do we get any sense in this document about the kind of rationale behind that? Well, um, I think you do get a bit, obviously, there are that sort of indications it's about how hard the slaves work. But perhaps the interesting thing is it's um, the masters are not required to provide any reason mm. for the manumission, which sort of suggests that there could be rather than perhaps just purely economic performance. Some other indications, for example, if they serve the family well, they, uh, they care, you know, they, they are liked by the family, that's enough. It's considered down to the master's discretion, yeah. whether they're worthy of, it, of freedom. Yeah. yeah. I also think that maybe there's um, a, there could be a religious element to it as well. If you consider how, how close we've said that the Catholic Church and the, the French state is, if their ultimate goal is to create a functioning Catholic, good Catholic members of society, then the action of a slave being indoctrinated into Catholicism but then uh, freed by his master would possibly lead to an, an expansion of the faith in that way as well. Yeah, maybe. I mean, we can't really tell, can we? But we, we do see slaves interacting with the families of their masters, don't we? I mean, if you look, for example, in 13. Yeah. And Eleanor, do you want to have to go on there? Um, I was actually looking at... Um, yeah. Whatever. <laughs> Ten actually with okay. the duty of care when right? he said like the interaction. Yeah. You'd obviously assume that slaves are mistreated and uh, but this this does imply that the masses do have this duty and they can't abuse slaves in um, a way that is not in line with the yeah. okay. And what happens if the slaves are being abused? Is there anything they can do? Um, the masters are prosecuted. Yeah, the so yeah. yes. <laughs> How will they be prosecuted? I mean, what do you, what impression of society do you get from that clause? We discover that there are some other people, at least, yeah. who aren't masters or slaves. You you get the, the suggestion that everyone is ultimately sort of liable for their own actions, yeah. especially if you look at sort of that combined with you know there's the mistreatment of the slaves and then but the 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 punishment that the slave will receive if he strikes his master or the wife of his master, uh, which is sort of indicates also that there's, uh, as alongside the claim that this, if the slave um, attacks their master, 
there's an incredibly uh, care, important aspect of dedication sort of care and family, mm-hmm. uh, and that the slaves are seen as almost as betrayal mm-hmm. if they um, act poorly against their masters and they're punished even harsher than if they had just done the crime to a, a random stranger. And that's particularly true when they're no longer slaves, yes. isn't it? As we see in 14. We'll just go back for a moment to 10, though. So if a slave is not treated properly, what should he or she do? Notify the attorney. Yeah. Which, yeah, I mean, this, this kind of element of codifying the relationship yeah. more was, was certainly very interesting yeah. to me in that you perhaps don't expect there to be that... Uh, permitted level of autonomy and then the, the fact that there are these protocols yeah. uh, in place for, for slaves to address certain people or for there to be um, ins- inspections or a particular standard that their, their diet and their accommodation has to be at um, but it com- complicates the relationship. Like, sort of continue on from that, it definitely is. I think the fact that it's, so the use of the attorney as an independent figure mm-hmm. who's not a master or a slave and is, although this is, you know, it pos- is pos- probably a representative of the French state in the colony to mm-hmm. some extent, which demonstrates just how influential the central authority for the government is. In the, either, even the lowest slave can go, go above their masters directly and appeal to the French government in the form of the attorney. Right. Uh, it demonstrates that just the, con- the level of control the state has, uh, and it's also its extent of caring for all of its citizens, whether master or slave. But then... you. You say the, they've got this level of care. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not talking from I'm talking from an assumption here, but the slaves wouldn't necessarily be able to read this this code noir if it mm-hmm. was available to them. Yeah. So they, it's written that they have a right to an attorney, an, an attorney. Yes. But are they actually aware of that right? So maybe it's just yeah. I mean, presented yeah. that way. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. The fact that it is a published constitutional document. Uh, coming from France to overseas colonies that would have been very incredibly distant and hard to access sort of to build on that means that this is this is it's like a, a hopeful document that this yeah. is how we hope the the relationship would look like ideally but the when it comes to the actual relationship that existed at the time it's, it's perhaps it's very different it's the 17th century so i'm assuming even masters may not be literate so. yeah Mm. What do you make of the second half of that article? So you're absolutely right, so the slaves are only presumably going to find out about their rights. Yeah. Um, are they, well, I mean, do we get any sense in this that slaves might be literate? Just kind of stick with that point for a moment. Nothing in the document suggests that some slaves might actually be educated. Um, well, uh, just perhaps you could draw that from 15. Uh, yeah. saying that a manumitted slave has the same rights, privileges and liberties, mm-hmm. which implies that they can at least live to some extent the same form of life that a master would. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they can live independently, which would perhaps imply a combination of you know, literacy, uh, some basic understanding of, eco- of personal economics and, um, and how to look after your own household. Yeah. So that implies that certainly that some of the slaves are nearing the level of the masters in terms of intelligence and ability. I would say that it's, it seems to be very hierarchical and it doesn't really specify the liberties enjoyed by their masters but rather someone born free and then you've also got another social hierarchy there so they may not be uh, kept as a slave in servitude but they wouldn't have the same liberties as someone with the power of a master. Yeah, because yeah. we already know from the attorneys and the priests that there are people in yeah, this place exactly. that are. Yeah. But if you look maybe just 13, Article 13, does that...? Oh, yeah. Oh, cool. oh so if slaves can, can be placed in the will of a master in Brian, but, um, it's yeah. and that they have tutors of their children. Mm. So it implies that some slaves are, well, perhaps more, not necessarily, but on similar levels of education to adult um, colon, colonial masters in that they are trusting a local man with their children's education, right? probably they would intend to become a master of their own one day. Mm, yeah, so you've definitely got this kind of different layers of slavery. Some people who are clearly less at. Although, sorry, just, yeah. just building on, the, yeah, yeah. on both of those things, I think one thing that is also quite striking is that 
although we est we've established that there, there is this hierarchical uh, element that there, are, there could be slaves who are more educated and less educated, the slaves and masters are referred to completely as two very distinct mm. separate groups. Yes. So although a hierarchy existed, the, the state that was creating this constitution was quite eager to either um, ignore it or try and address it by, um, by referring to it and codifying every, everyone in just two spheres, basically. Do you, think, do you think the state's troubled by having these slaves who are clearly better educated, who may be involved more in economic transactions? Um, yeah, I, I think without a doubt, because there's that um, there's the comments about the commodities and the ban on sugarcane trading, as you said in seven. Yeah. Which but is who's banned from trading sugar? I mean, uh, slaves. But can the? I, I think you said here earlier that that's interesting because even the masters can't yes. allow the slaves to do this. Yes. So this French state is regulating the sugar cane. Uh, which it? I suppose yeah. you could say is perhaps because it would be an esteemed most what may be one of the most profitable for the French government, perhaps through taxation or um, protectionist methods, that as a result they don't want either, even the master or interfering with the French government's major source of income from the colony. Yeah. So that suggests actually maybe flattening this yes. distinction between masters and slaves. Yeah. yeah. Um, I also thought we'll probably ask, kind of, sort of carry on what yeah, you're saying about the hierarchy absolutely. in 14 and 15. Mm -hmm is you get a sense of hypocrisy here in how the freed slaves are treated. So in 15 it says, we grow up to manumitted slaves the same rights, privileges and liberties enjoyed by persons born free. So implying complete inequality. But in 14 it says, they have to retain a particular respect for their former masters, a duty that would not be expected of someone who'd never had a master. Um, and perhaps so that indicates that there's some sort of hypocrisy there in their treatment of especially slave peoples or freed slaves. Uh, I'd perhaps suggest maybe but that's um, as a result of an attempt by the French state to again reinforce this sense of hierarchy, that even the, to make sort of a subcategory between the master and the slave, not quite let their uh, hierarchy fall apart, and ensure that they are still lower, they can never truly achieve like the meritocratic heights of a freed man. Do you think the state's more worried about masters overly exploiting the slaves and damaging the economy? Or masters getting too close to the slaves and ganging up with them against the French state, it's all a bit of both. I say the relationship between masters and the, the, the way they behave with their slaves is more of a concern for, for example, they're punished in different ways, whereas the, um, the masters would be prosecuted, which seems somewhat vague, um, if they treat their slaves mm -hmm. inhumanely, but then the slaves would be punished with death, so that's just reinforcing the hierarchy and the orders to maybe distance them in some way, the yeah. masters from the slaves. Do you think the state's worried about them getting too close? The slaves? Yeah, to the masters. I mean, I suppose you see this maybe at the beginning, perhaps in... In section two, article two. Oh, oh, so perhaps when it comments about these religious meetings, mm -hmm. it says masters who allow or tolerate such meetings among their slaves will be subject to the same penalties. Which is uh, uh, treason. Treason, 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 treason. Yeah, it's quite bad, penalty. right? So yeah. it's it's saying that perhaps that there is no tolerance for a master who is aware his slaves are of a different religious or practice. Uh, and whether it's beneficial for him to allow them to just live their own lives in quite a sort of friendly manner, he has to enforce the Catholic doctrine in order to maintain the hierarchy yeah. and yeah. distance himself from the slaves. I think it's, it's striking, isn't it, that the, the state is both worried about distance between yeah. them and ill-treatment, but also this closeness. Great. Well, thank you very much. That was very interesting. So that was question three from this year's 2016 paper. Um, thank you.